welcome to the CPTS. <laughs> I'm going to scratch that and start over. Come on. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to the CPTSD podcast. I'm Tabitha Bird Weaver, licensed psychotherapist, here with my colleague and partner, Beth Paste, licensed professional counselor supervisor. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit more about what happens if you had an emotionally immature parent. How do you know that? What might be showing up in your life now? And where to go from here? Beth, you wanna take us away? Yes. Um, What you guys are are getting when we start recording is like the tail end of just the like spicy, hyped conversation that Tab and I are having. Like, what are we gonna talk about? And like, how do we want to, you know, what information can we help get across to you or that what may be supportive to you? Um, And the, the thought I had for today's episode was how do we respond to having emotionally immature parents or, um, you know, how do we respond to some manner of family dysfunction that is chronic and is ongoing? Um, Particularly, how do we wire ourselves to cope? Um, and we've got, we've got some questions for you. Um, some of the, the really beautiful reviews we've received so far from this podcast are people saying like, this is helping me wake up in, into an awareness of, um, kind of the depths of, of the dysfunction of my upbringing. And I'm going to start out with a little bit of, um, present day present day. So, you know, we, we have often said on this podcast, like if you're just waking up, if you're just waking up uh, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about like, what does, what does that look like in, you know, adult life? Um, So in a present day question, or a lot of times I'll work with someone who comes to me with the question, what is wrong with me? Mm. And Mm. I, them, what do you think is wrong with you? And they will say things like, I'm stupid. I'm lazy. Uh, I am, uh, I think I've got borderline personality disorder because I like can't deal with, um, you know, how other people respond to me. Um, and then when I ask them about their childhood, they say things like, it was fine. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I had great parents. They, they're actually really great. They're really great. They're really good. They're really good to me. They're really so on, so on, so on. And um, that's so relatable to me. Um, Me too. I was reading the book Toxic Parents by Susan Forward when the, when like the penny dropped for me and I was just like, oh, Oh, I had an abusive mother. Mm. Oh, whoa. Because because the convenience of there's something wrong with me, what it also gives to me is the ability, the illusion um, that if I can figure out what's wrong with me, I can fix it. Yes. And, oh, my gosh. Yes. And that it's one thing that needs to be fixed. You just haven't found it yet because you're not smart enough, as you were saying, or you don't work hard enough. Uh, right. Or you haven't focused on the right thing. Or it's the next achievement. If it's not the job, then it must be the partnership. And if it isn't the partnership, then it must be the child. And if it's not the child, then maybe it's a boat. And if it's not the boat, then maybe it's a PhD. And if it's not that, oh boy, maybe it's plastic surgery. No disrespect to anybody who wants any of these things. Correct. Ever had the miserable experience of achieving something, feeling good for just a minute, and then almost immediately going, oh no, but that wasn't it. Or enough. Uh, so back to this yeah. idea of like, what's wrong with me? Um, and then, so the combination of what is wrong with me and it couldn't possibly have been my childhood. Right. So um, some of the the things we'll talk about to start is like, how do we wire ourselves to cope with 
with family dysfunction? How do we wire ourselves to cope with just sort of like sick systems? Um, Because we're going to start talking about systems more in the future beyond just like a nuclear family. Uh, But for today, we're still talking about the family. Um, It's supposed to be your safe place. Um, So for people who do not remember their childhoods, that's totally normal. Yep. If you grew up in a dysfunctional family, for people who remember their childhoods as like kind of uh, steeped in mythology and fantasy, hmm. and I'm going to explain myself, that's very normal for growing up in a dysfunctional family. Who is perpetuating the mythology? Why, your caregivers, of course. Right. We are great. We are loving you. We are taking extraordinarily excellent care of you. Mm -hmm. And if you aren't feeling all this good loving, it must be because there's something wrong with you. That's dead on, Beth. I was difficult. I was difficult. Mm. And I'll tell you what, I've never valued a quality so much in my life as that one, because it's also what got me through the beginning healings of CPTSD was being tenacious and honest. And I think most of us who face this in our life are extremely courageous. And I just want to add, I just want to add to what you were saying that not only are the experiences you're having normal and, and typical of people who had a similar raising, um, raising through their childhood, they're also really important because they tend to be protective. Mm -hmm. Right. And so like you learn to go along with it and feel like you're not good enough because the alternative challenging the system is way worse than that. And as we've said, you know, as we've said before, what is a six-year-old going to do? Pack a big bowl, that little like handkerchief on a stick, leave, hop a train, get a job, get an apartment. Um, so, so two things that are like pretty, I, I don't want to say classic, but like I, I've seen often in someone's mm-hmm. present day symptomology when they're not totally aware of the fact that they might have complex post-traumatic stress disorder is I know that there is something inherently wrong with me and it couldn't have possibly been anything from my childhood because I have been fed the message over the course of a lifetime that my parents are great, my caregivers are great, and I am the one that is the problem. So that's like, if this is hitting home for you or if you're starting to feel something sort of like gross in your gut, Mm. pick with us Um, because healing is, as Tab just said, healing is about turning around and facing Um, that's painful, but you can do it today because you're safe enough to do it today. Whereas when you were six, when you were 10, when you were eight, you were not. So, uh, what are some of the ways, um, because I'm going to throw in a couple, but I've also been talking for a while. So I want to hear from you. Uh, Okay. Some of the ways that folks with, um, kind of untreated or maybe even like Un, unaware, undiagnosed CPTSD kind of move through the world as adults. Right. So, I mean, the things that were most poignant for me and that I see most frequently with my clients are an ongoing and pervasive sense of not enoughness. And so <laughs> you might describe that as poor self-esteem or poor self-valuing. There's lots of ways to talk about it, but the bottom line is no matter what you do, no matter how you present it's just not enough. Mm. And that's your fault. Oh boy. Right. And so the bottom line message is you are not enough. And how can anything fill us and make us happy and satisfied if we're not enough to begin with? The other thing I think that um, is a really common experience from people, and it's a little off the emotional piece that we've been talking about, but if you have an autoimmune disorder, or a chronic health issue, I'd be looking (laughs) back to see what possibly could have generated that. Like, how long have you had it? 
right? So for example, for me, I was diagnosed with complete adrenal fatigue at the age of 16. That's not setting me up for a life of endurance and energy, right? I was already drained. And so fortunately, my mom was a bit of a flower child and I went to an herbalist who was able to help me through that. But if you've had a history of autoimmune or chronic issues, then that is definitely a red flag that you may be suffering from the effects of CPTSD. And I think the last, and, and mm -hmm, it's not the biggest because they're all pain, right? But the last thing that I want to talk about right now for a second is that there's an experience of emotionality that happens with those of us who have had exposure to too many ACEs or to chronic dysfunction. And it can be a spectrum of reactivity, but fundamentally there's a feeling of being out of control with your emotions. And so either you, maybe you're somebody who goes from zero to 60 with rage or anxiety, and maybe you're somebody who goes from zero to negative 60 and you shut down and, yeah. and numb, right? But that there's, there's an, you are aware that there's an over response with your emotions to whatever is happening. So an example is uh, when this really came to light for me is I backed out of my driveway mor one morning with my coffee mug sitting on top of my car. And as I went over that first bump, you know, to get off the, the sidewalk, it fell and shattered. And I was livid livid when I got out of the car that that had happened. And I realized right in that moment, okay, this is overreactive because number one, I don't even know where I got that mug. So it's not like I'm mourning my grandma's teacup, right? Number two, coffee's cheap. It's not like I've just lost something I can't replace. Number three, nobody is even aware that this has happened. So, and that was what cued me in to start looking at my core beliefs is because I felt like I was being watched. Core beliefs, right? Tabitha. Yeah. Oh. All right. So here we go. And, right. And so the core beliefs that came out of that realization, like I am overreacting to this spill, was things I'd been working on already for 15 or 20 years at that point, Beth, right? It was like, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. I never do anything right. Mm -hmm. And everybody's watching me. And there's a feeling of danger that went with that because I was managed if you know what I mean. <laughs> I always had somebody looking over my shoulder. Yeah. And so um, it's not safe to make mistakes Oof. Oof. would be a core belief that came from that. So the three things just to recap are that emotional overreactivity I'm talking about, some type of physical issue happening with you that's chronic or autoimmune oriented. And then I completely forgot the first one I already said. <laughs> Maybe I'm a little triggered. I don't know. I think that was. I think you talked about emotional overwhelm. You talked about um, autoimmune and oh. then like pervasive, not, not being valuable enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So those are some of the present day things that really made me focus on, wow, something is really not right here in a way where it wasn't just about me striving to be the better me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. So How about um, you, Beth? yeah, thank you. Thank you for all of that. Cause yeah, as you're talking, like my eyes keep getting big cause I'm like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, like, Oh, that is so relatable. Um, so I have worked in the field of addictions counseling for mm. now about a decade. Um, and one of the ways that you, you can kind of check this may not be for everyone. This doesn't apply to everyone, but say, for example, if using a minor mood altering substance makes you feel normal, whatever you think is like the definition of normal. Um, I, you know, I talk about this man all the time. It would be like the ultimate fantasy. If he would come on the podcast, Gabor Mate, you know, like the, the, um, the godfather of like, uh, trauma and substance use, um, and he says that like kids who have trauma in their rear view, the first time they use substances, they're not just getting an intoxicating effect. They're experiencing the, um, the analgesic or pain relieving effect of like not mm -hmm. having to carry all of the emotional um, or, or like, yeah, all the emotional burden that they have been carrying. So you do, you know, you try opiates or you try marijuana for the first time at 14 and you go, oh. <gasps> Is this what mm. normal feels like? 
why didn't anybody tell me? I want to feel this way all the time. So we'll talk more about substance use in later episodes, but one, one first uh, indicator in present day is if you don't get just sort of like a pleasant, like, hmm, that's nice kind of sensation from like using alcohol or marijuana or something like that, you go, oh, right. Okay. That's, that's like taking a Tylenol for me. That's like, that's like pain relief. Uh, that would be an indicator. Um, the, the, I was reading something last night in a book that I'm reading about, um, you know, trauma, trauma survivors, and like what it feels like to be in present day. One of the things the author mentions is um, this, this sort of way of moving through the world. It's like, things just seem to happen to me. Mm. This is described in like adult children of alcoholics and family dysfunction liter literature as like being a reactor and not an actor in your life. All oh, right. So somebody shows up to session and goes, I always end up in the same kind of relationships with the same kind of dirt bags. These things just seem to happen to me. I always end up in the same kind of work situations with the same toxic bosses. These things just seem to happen to me. So if you were neglected as a child, you never got the opportunity to like feel like an agent in your own life. Mm -hmm. like why? If all you're ever doing is reacting to other people, you become a reactor in your life, not an actor. So when somebody's like, I love you, girl, you're like, oh, okay, well, I mean, I guess I'll just respond to that because this person is saying they love me. So I just have to sort of like, Instead of going, do I like this person back? Does this person make me feel safe? Or does this person, person make me feel butterflies? Don't get me started. Like what do, what are, what is traumatic patterning when you meet someone and you're like, they feel like home to me. Ooh, right. <laughs> what was home like? Yikes. I think seriously, the best thing I ever did for myself was take a three-year dating break. Cause but, I, you know, man. I hear you. You're so right. But what if the only place I know how to feel filled up or loved is when I'm taking care of somebody else? Absolutely. It was a huge, hard decision. Yes. So, um, so one of the ones is like, if substance use sort of makes you feel normal. Um, another one for me is if you are moving through the world going, why do I keep ending up in the same terrible situations over and over again. Yes. That for me is a real indicator that like, you don't see yourself in the equation because when you were a child, you were not being factored in to the equation of your family unit. Other people mm -hmm. always came first. So sometimes people come to me and go, I have blank attachment style because they've kind of read up on something and they're like, okay, I see this one. I always end up showing up and loving people who are running away from me and I chase them because if I could just get them to love me back, I know I would finally feel good. They'd yes. love it too. And as I've said to you before, trying to make someone do something that they don't want to do even for their own betterment is indeed like stuffing them into a metaphysical sack and trying to drag them somewhere that they don't want to go. And you shouldn't do that to people, but sorry, I said should. Um, if you feel yourself like you're in that, in that pattern, keep listening. Um, the answer is always self-love, uh, but mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later today too. Um, so you're a reactor instead of an actor in your life. Sometimes that shows up as like, I need to get unavailable love from people who can't give it to me. But another one is people want to love me and I've got to run away from them. So that's yes, that avoid attachment style. So, you know, there are people in my life who are trying to um, get through the walls that I've built up. I want the love, but every time things get too close, I got to run away or I got to light it on fire. The whole thing about codependency is if you like to run away, well, it's not really any fun to not run away from anyone. You got to go find somebody to chase you. <laughs> and if you like to chase people, 
Who are you going to chase if you don't have anybody to run away from you? So these types of folks go together like peanut butter and jelly. They do. <laughs> but then someone, I think, go ahead. Finish your thought. Someone comes to me and goes, why don't my relationships work? And I go, let's, let's get curious about what you know about relationships and where you learned it. Mm-hmm. That's a great way to lead into that. And I think there's a, the third way about relationships is also, even if you have relatively stable relationships that are good and, and kind toward you, but you still feel hollow, you're still lonely, even in the middle of a group of friends who obviously are caring for you. Mm-hmm right? Or a partner who gives and gives and gives. And I realize codependency can be part of what we're talking about here. But right, I mean, if you have a partner who is relatively stable, and you feel like you can't connect to them, that could be an indicator that you've got some looking to do into your childhood. And I think just to add another thought on top, if you feel guilty about having a successful, anything really, but if you feel guilty about being happy or being satisfied or letting something be enough, that's a huge indicator that you are potentially needing to look into your childhood a little more deeply. And also just a side note, Beth, some of these things can happen outside of our family of origins, yeah. right? So, I mean, some some of these things are true in domestically violent or intimate partner type relation, violent relationships, but we're just focusing on family today. So we're not meaning to exclude that. Um, we'll talk about it another time. Yeah, I got <laughs> mm-hmm. one more thought and this one is, um... It, it kind of goes a little bit more with like having a more avoidant style. But um, one of the other things is, is if you had someone who was using you to meet their needs, um, you may not know that right now, but like, let's say instead, if you regularly feel invaded by people, which leads you to need to create some manner of secret life that's only yours. Hmm. The very first time I ever got drunk, I was very young, super young. And um, then the next day I went to church, okay? And the pattern that continued for me for a very long time was doing something that gave me a lot of pleasure, but needing it to be a part of a secret life for me. Because then Mm -hmm. there was something I had that people didn't know about and that felt good. But it also, if we, if we sort of like spin the whole cycle around, like make close the loop, feeling guilty and feeling bad about myself for having something that I enjoyed was also part of that. So if you're someone who like finds yourself cheating on partners, because that's like a thing that's very thrilling for you, or like you steal a little bit of stuff from work. It's not like a lot of stuff from work, just like a little bit. Like this idea that like you having a secret life that nobody else knows about feels really um, like that's meeting a need for you. That may also be something that could like give you the indicator that you would want to poke around in your childhood. Who was invading you emotionally, physically, uh, psychologically, that would lead you to like need to protect something that's only yours Mm. at all costs. And sometimes at the cost of some of your relationships and your own well-being. And your respect for yourself, which you wholly deserve. Mm. You know, um, I think two other things I would throw in here is one, we've kind of touched on it through some of the other things we've talked about, but not trusting your own instincts is a really good indicator that you could do a little digging or a little reobserving of your childhood and maybe look for places where you were discounted or um, perhaps mocked, dismissed, any of those types of words where you were um, shamed for yeah. having your own opinion. Mm -hmm. And another one that I, that may be very specific, but I think applies to a lot of people is if you were trapped in caring for your parents right now, 
and you feel trapped, you feel obligated. It's not a joy. There's a really good indication there that you are continuing a pattern that was set up for you to do that. Here's a, um, can I tell a real quick story? Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, so to speak. And so we all are talking about what we're feeling presently so that we don't continue to perpetuate the issue and we try and make some change, right? When I was a kid, um, my grandparents, my dad's parents lived really close to us. And um, my grandmother was super intrusive. And I remember Beth watching my dad, who was the person that was intrusive for me. Mm right? Watching my dad eat so much sugar on holidays that he would literally pass out on the couch and not have to deal with her. I remember, I just, I'm observing that he felt obliged and resentful of that relationship, very similar to what I feel. So with him or did feel with him. So if you are fixing problems that your parents keep creating, or you feel like you have to be there for them, it might be time to look a little more closely at that. As you were speaking, there was something else that came up for me. Um, and this can be so confusing. It can be so painful because when you said mistrusting your instincts and um, I want to make a distinction that there is indeed a difference between your gut instincts, your truest, wisest self and your traumatic patterning. Remember when yeah. I told you about like butterflies, say you go into a job interview and the people interviewing you go, you're like, so what's the job description like here? And they go, well, we're, you know, kind of like in a state of transition right now. So we're going to need everybody to like wear a lot of hats and like do a lot of things that are not really in their job description. So I can't give you a clear distinction, like what you're going to need to do here. And something in you might go, I know how to do this. Mm. That's not your gut, baby. That's traumatic patterning that goes, this feels familiar. Remember when mm -hmm. I said earlier about, ooh, this person feels like home to me. Chaotic environments can feel familiar. And we go, well, my gut's telling me that this is the place I need to be. And I'm going to reflect to you that you may have some learning to do there, which is always mm. for you, even though it's sometimes very painful. Sometimes, I just said sometimes like learning is sometimes painful when you have CPTSD. It's mostly painful in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and then it gets a little better. Um, mm -hmm. But somewhere underneath all of that is like, imagine a sort of like child in a dark room, banging on the door being like, get out of here. This is not it. But you who have sort of ordered and patterned yourself to thrive in chaotic environments, some part of you is like, I'm going to win here. I know how to do it. These people are also telling me that like, probably they're not going to be able to pay me very much, like not what I'm worth, which also feels very familiar. But they're also telling me if I play my cards right, I might be able to like get their approval in a year. Mm. And there's this other part of you, this like dissociated child part, maybe that's just like danger, 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 danger. Yeah. But we have turned off our danger signaling which is also part of being able to trust your gut. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk a little bit more about like your, like some of those questions you have from like in your childhood did blank, but this was just like the cur the precursor for you. It's like, does this, is this what your adult life feels like? If so, you are in the right place. Absolutely. You know, you're bringing up a really good point about how to differentiate between trauma patterning and instinct. And in my experience, two things have been true for me and my clients. One is the instinct voice is quiet and soft in the beginning mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. versus, oh, got it. That's your trauma patterning. Yeah. Right. So it's like, a, you got to pay attention. 
if you've got any type of doubt, listen to the doubt, look for the voice, right? Uh -huh. The other thing is that one of the things that um, can be helpful, um, if not taken to extremes, is initially when you are aware that you've got some patterning that you need to change or want to change, it can be very helpful to take all green flags as a pause button. Right. So like if you are getting a go, go, go sign, then that is actually an indicator to take a breath and oh. listen for the smaller voice or look at it from a different perspective. Talk with somebody you trust about it. Right. If you can have that kind of relationship yet. Yeah. But those green flags initially, it's why I took the dating break I was just talking about, because I was getting green flags and everyone was leading me further away from what my heart needed and what my what relationship I could participate in fully and be healing, mutually healing is what I'm trying to say there. So if you're getting bright green flags, that is a pause button. It looked like that was something you resonated with, Beth. Oh, yeah, as my eyebrows are just like shooting up and up and up. That's right. That's my like, oh, I'm hype. Um, and oh, and I may have just completely lost my train of thought too. We'll see if I can get it back. Um, that this can be enormously destabilizing and painful. Yes. As people go, I thought I knew myself. I thought that this was my personality. I thought, yeah. you know... And I'm here to say, like, this is why self-compassion and like, quote unquote, reparenting yourself is so precious and so important. You can keep being excellent and treat the perfectionism. Mm -hmm. You can keep caring a lot about helping other people and lose the codependency aspect of that. You can be yourself. You're not going to lose your capital S self when you start to try and listen a little bit deeper. You're just going to get to know yourself better. Um, the other thing I was thinking about when you were saying green flags, if I was going to describe that to someone in a different way, because they're like, what do you mean green flags? What do you mean green flags? What I would say is like, if something makes you feel sort of intoxicated, a job prospect, a dating prospect, a new friendship where you and this person are spending all your time together. Um, that's, that's also that like, what's the difference between sort of like your gut telling you something and your trauma patterning going, this is the place where you're going to be able to recreate the old stuff and rewrite the ending this time to finally get you what you need. Yep. Ooh. And the change comes with not recreating. And that's the trick. It's oh. doing it different. And I, I'm loving what you're saying, Beth, because we do fear that we'll lose ourselves. But what you're actually going to end up losing is a construct that you had to create to survive and that your parents or caregivers perpetuated. Mm -hmm. And so the more, the more peel or layers that come off of that onion, as we've heard in therapy so many times, the onion layers, right? The more that come off of that, the more of your true core self you'll actually have. That's right. Right. For, for example, you might decide one day that you actually are valuable and important, regardless of what your parents told you. And there's nothing like getting rewarding satisfaction out of life than showing up as your true self and taking it as it comes, knowing that you can make the next decision you need to make. If something doesn't, I mean, talk, I'm kind of rambling right now, but if something talking about perfectionism, if it doesn't come out perfect or the way you expect, and a lot of us had to plan on how to have outcomes be safe. Right. And so like, I can see all the choices still in my mind. If I go this way, this will happen. If I go this way, this will happen. Over planning is definitely an indicator that you should be looking at your past or could be looking at your past. I want to loop back around because I kind of just went sideways there. The point I'm making here is that if you show up as your true self with compassion instead of codependency, not only is that going to be much more satisfying to you, but the outcome will be better. Mm. Mm. right if you yeah. show up without guilt and experience something that really is enjoyable to you or maybe it's a learning experience that you feel like you can grow from it's still going to be more satisfying than operating from this false construct that we had to create to be safe and so when when tab is talking about the rewards 
Um, that person who's been dangling conditional approval over here and telling you that if you just act the way they want you to act, you're going to finally get it. They ain't got it. That's not where it is. I'm here to tell you anybody yeah. that wants to like sort of create that kind of feedback loop with you um, doesn't have the sort of emotional availability to actually give you any of the stuff that they're like, if you acted right, I could give you love. Transactional love isn't unconditional love. It's just not, that's not it. Um, but man, I'm going to tell you, like when, when Tab is talking about the gifts, like one time somebody came in and told me a story about like showing up to a first date with someone who was like visibly intoxicated. And they looked and like everything in their body was like, don't make a big deal out of this. This could go sideways. But instead they went, have you been drinking? And the person was like, yeah, you know, I was like a little, little nervous about our date. So like I had a couple of drinks before uh, we uh, met and my client went, okay, cool. Well, that doesn't work for me. So I'm going to go ahead and just end things here. And wow. Left. Then they came back and told me about it. And I was just like, and how do you feel about the choice that you made? And they were like, you know, me a couple of years ago would have just sat in that sort of like anxiety response, knowing that this wasn't right for me, but staying anyway. And then they said, you know, the piece de resistance was, but I have standards now. Nice. <laughs> like I wouldn't describe myself as like shouting in my office, but when my clients say things like that and I'm like, yes, <laughs> to hear someone just like organically have it come up, but I have standards now and that doesn't work for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so we, we, um, I, you know, I, I, I am a linear time person. Uh, I started a timer before we, uh, we started our talk today. Um, do you want to just like check in on some of those, those questions that you, um, that you would, you would encourage someone to ask themselves about their childhood or like, how do you wire to cope with a, with a dysfunctional family? Um, well, I was talking about a list from, uh, Lindsay Gibson that basically if your parents have these qualities, then yeah. they were probably, I mean, we can definitely talk about that, but we can also talk about the neurology and how neurons that fire together, wire together. Right. Oh, and so right. these changes, these changes that we're talking about on a neurological level take time and they take, as you've said many times, Beth practice, right? Right. And so being able to walk away from a potential new partner who's a little tipsy when you meet is the process, it's the um, outcome. There we go. Lost the word. It's the outcome of a lot of work that person had already put in. Yeah. No so, doubt. Right. So which which do you think is more helpful for our, our listeners right now? Using using our treasured um, back pocket tool, idiomotor cueing. I'm really getting that we should be talking about neurology. And I'm not Great, even going to say anything that. about what I just did. I'm just going to like, we're just going to move that way. Perfect. Google it, folks. So, well, I think um, if I were going to start the conversation about neurology, I would start really broad and just say, please remember that, again, we're talking about family of origin or your caregivers when you were very small, under the age of 10, let's say. Um, because that is when a lot of our developmental activities are happening that make us understand who we are as a self. That's right. Right. And so if we just start from the, the basic of, uh, well, let's, let's go more than basic. How about starting in utero? <sighs> right. If you are forming in your mother's womb and her hormonal spikes are doing this because of current abuse or trauma in her relationship. And, and by the time we have ears formed in utero, we can indeed hear what is going on around. It's why everybody plays Mozart to their tummies, right? <laughs> that, my point is, if you're starting off your life on this planet in an unstable, abusive, or chaotic environment, it matters from ingest, you know, ingestion on. Yeah. And right. And so we're also we've talked before on this podcast about how litty bitty babies and toddlers are remarkably egocentric because that's how their brain is. Yes. And so we start our experience off 
with a couple of things that are complicated. One is that we internalize things. And the other is we have a felt sense, maybe that is our experience pre-verbally, right? And so if you're an infant lying in a crib, listening to people yell and things flying about your home, it starts creating a neurology of terror. Yeah. What do you think about that, Beth? Well, as you're talking, I'm also thinking about um, the first thing, I, this book, it was in my own therapist's office and like, she's, a, she's way out there. I'm a big fan, obviously. Uh, she has a book called Voices from the Womb. This guy, mm. and I'll have his name immediately on deck, uh, wrote a book called Voices from the Womb. He's a clinical hypnotherapist in California. And he writes about how like, he, can, he does hypnotic womb regression with clients. And they, they are sort of going to the state where they're like, this is how mom felt about me, the baby. This is how dad felt about me, the fetus. Like, this is how welcomed I was or how unwelcomed I was. Or like, dad didn't want me, but mom was like really like desperate to have me. And I, in that moment, really wired myself or like aligned with like the need, which was to make mom feel good. And so yes. I was thinking that dad was like my nemesis. Um, and if you're listening to this right now and you're like, oh, hogwash, that's nonsense. That's cool. You don't have to read that book. Um, but if what we're talking about feels like it's hitting you or you know something about your birth story, um, like that your umbilical cord was wrapped around your neck or that you, the last child, were not planned or that there were many miscarriages before you, things like that, um, you may have. Or I just want to add in or that your mom had major depressive disorder during your in okay. utero time right. Mm -hmm. right? or that mom had postpartum depression after you were born. Like these yes. are all these. are So as it relates to how you wire for your original environment, um, children are black and white thinkers. Mm -hmm. Infants, children are black and white thinkers. That's another like so that thing about like core beliefs, um, you grow into an adult that's like, if my life is not going right then there must be something fundamentally wrong with me, right? Instead of like the gray area of like my choices, my patterning, my agency, my, you know, my self-awareness and so on. Um, so the, the big thing around complex trauma is children um, usually get either one of the two or the dastardly combination of both, which is there's something wrong with me the reason this doesn't feel safe and I don't feel good is because I am bad. I am wrong. Or the world is an extraordinarily dangerous place. And the reason I don't feel good and safe is because everything everywhere always is dangerous. And then if you tangle these two up together, then it feels like you just really can't win for trying. Mm-hmm. And, the, and it's dangerous to try. Bingo. So the whole point mm -hmm. of being an emotionally resourced adult is that when you come home after having had an experience that was frightful, unpleasant, scary, hard, um, that resourced adult gets to go, here's another way to look at it. That takes a radical amount of attention from an adult. And children don't need that like every once in a while. They need mm -hmm. all the time. Um, a, a tender memory for me is of a friend of mine. Um, his, his daughter is now much older, but at the time she was maybe like three and she wanted to watch TV, but she didn't want to wear her glasses. And dad was like, mm -hmm. all right, you can watch TV if you put on your glasses. That's one of your choices. And if you don't want to wear your glasses, you, you, don't, you won't watch TV. And you could watch her little like, it's almost like her forehead is like wrinkling and like everything's like electricity is like sparking out of her ears. Cause she's like, no, 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 no. Like, that's not what I want. But what he's doing in this moment, this just sort of like moment of adequate parenting is there's something she wants. That's like not good for her. And then he's giving her agency options and choice mm -hmm. in a structured boundaried way. So not just what's wrong with you, no, get out of my, get out of the living room, you, whatever, whatever, like shut up, put on your glasses, 
why did I pay for those glasses in the first place? Dad takes oh my gosh. and he's like, okay, kid, this one's not an option, but you do have options. Which one would you like to pick? It's kind of the same way with parenting, this sort of trick of like, we can read a story and then brush teeth, or we can brush teeth and then read a story. Which one mm-hmm. would you like to choose? We're entertaining and introducing choice to little brains that is developmentally appropriate. Not if you don't stop crying, you're going to break mom's heart. Oh That's my gosh. Yes. Big of a, uh, a responsibility for a developing brain. Putting it mildly. For sure. I'm just enjoying thinking of my own kid as you're talking about this, because we used to do the, the four point choice. If you choose to put on pants, <laughs> Go on. <laughs> then you then you choose to go to the store with me. Come on. If you choose that. not to put on pants, then you choose not to go to the store with me, right? And you can choose blue pants or red pants. Totally up to you. Ooh. That's a lot of choice giving. And and guess what? That empowers your kid to start trusting their own decisions. And you might have the same experience I had when my child about age six looked at me and said, well, mother, he never called me mother, except in these conversations. Well, mother, those aren't my choices. I know. I'm like, yes. hmm. <laughs> I had to rethink about that. And, and, you know, the point is, because he had choices, he had the ability to say if it was his choice or not. I did not receive that. I was more on the other end that you were talking about. And so I just want to be encouraging. If you're listening right now and you have kids, it's not too late. That's right. There's it's not too late. The thing that we, we taught in parenting classes at an agency I used to work at, it's not about being perfect. It's not about never making mistakes. It's always about the repair. Because the other thing yep. you're showing that child is that it is okay to make mistakes and then it's okay to learn from them so that you could come back to your kid and go, I know I yelled at you today and I'm really sorry because yep. I am working on not doing that anymore, but I did it. And I, I bet that hurt you. Can you tell me more about what that was like for you? Um, How powerful in breaking the cycle that would be. Right. And if that doesn't sound super available right now, just marinate in it. Like nobody's saying tomorrow you have to show up and like do all of these skills. But as I've said um, in earlier episodes and we'll continue to say, imagination potentiates the brain. Imagine yourself calmly receiving your child's like, now as like, okay, of course, this is where you are brain developmentally. I need to go walk into the bathroom, scream into a dish towel for a second so that I can come back out and be like, okay. Um, I would, we need those socks on. Would you like to do that in your own time on a timer or would you like some help? Because we have to leave, you know, like this way, like when we're reactive, when we're activated, it's not easy to just like tap into that. Like I read that book about parenting. It's not always there. So when we talk about wiring, how you wire to show like, as a result of these kind of, um, Households, um, hypervigilance is an overactive nervous system. Yes. A heightened awareness of everything. Um, so given, given the example earlier of like that job interview where someone's like, you're going to have to do like 90,000 things all the time and we're going to underpay you, but we're going to also sort of like allude to the idea that like, you're, you're really going to make us proud because we're a family here, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, if you are, if you're super hyper vigilant, because that's how you wired to stay safe in a, in a dysfunctional, uh, household, then that's, that's like a place where your hyper vigilance is going to be seen as an asset. That doesn't necessarily mean that that place is safe or that hyper vigilance is good for your body. Uh, it's I a, would say hypervigilance is not good for your body and it really can contribute. Oh, no, well, hang on a second, sister. If you and I are like on a train that has been sort of like hijacked in the 1800s. All know. right. All right. Fair or, enough. I mean, I meant. Running across the African belt from a predator. We need it. 
we absolutely need it. Yeah, I'm. I really wasn't trying to discount <laughs> that, right? And good point. But if you are chronically hypervigilant, that means you're chronically inflamed. Right. Right. So, so you don't have to do that. And just looping back into the parenting, please don't feel like you have to do everything perfectly. That's right. And good luck not doing that because you probably will feel like you have to do everything perfectly if you've got any of the neurology we're talking about. I just want to say that it's been proven time and time again with research that apologies to children are parenting gold. So when you make a mistake, apologize. And not only are you healing them in that moment, you're healing your relationship and modeling better relationships for them in the future. So start where you can. And for a lot of us, it's with an apology. And also, if you are on the complete other side of that spectrum, where all you ever do is apologize for yourself all the time, Mm. uh, please don't misunderstand what we're talking about. You may need to be able to look at someone and sit in the silence of being like, oh, no, I meant what I said when I told you you can't talk to me that way anymore. Yeah. And that person be like, if, if everyone's used to you apologizing on the, that's the thing about like what we're talking about. It's never one thing or another. If you look at like classic symptoms of depression, it's like, are you sleeping too much? Are you sleeping too little? Are you not eating? Are you eating way too much? Because it's nothing is like, this is it. This is always it. Think about it more like the energetic ends of a spectrum life in balance, not the pinhead of perfection in the center of balance, but like, a little wiggle room in the center, that is the gray area. Mm -hmm. So if you never apologize, try one out. If you always apologize, see what happens if you don't say, oh, sorry, one time over the next two weeks. And that's why the Buddhists call that gray area in the middle, the warrior's path, because it's hard (laughs) work. Takes bravery. Yep. And I also want to be encouraging here with you, if you are on this path or beginning this path, that you, (laughs) I know I just said I was going to be encouraging, so wait for the end. You're going to blow it a lot of times. You're going to blow it a lot of times. And one of the things I learned in some parenting um, classes I took was Sometimes, um, and I will credit my professor, Dr. Daniel Sweeney, for teaching me this statement in grad school. Sometimes the most important thing you do is what you do after what you've just done. Right? And so whether it's apology or no apology, for you as an individual, unrelated to parenting, for you as an individual, taking that pause and realizing that that's th- that space of gray area we're talking about right now, that's like 30% of the line. It's, it's a broad space. There's a lot of movement in there. And so you, again, don't have to be on that pinhead that Beth was just talking about. Take the pause and look at the pattern. And, you know, when I talk about that pendulum swinging, which I often do in my work, um, if you mm-hmm. are, if you think about like a pendulum, right? Okay, so energetically, if you're not watching the video, you're listening to this, but just like, you know, a pendulum, physics, low key stuff. Um, if you've been holding something energetically at one far extreme for a lifetime, when you finally like release that, Where is it going to go if not to the other opposite extreme? That's normal too. But as in physics, as it becomes, as it goes through that natural progression, you still have the swings, but they're less extreme because of what you learned Mm -hmm. the last time you were out there. And then you still have a swing, but you you do it a little bit different because of the experience you had the last time. And then over time, you find yourself being able to like, and life isn't going to stop happening to you folks. It's just that you yourself are moving through life in a very different way, becoming more of an actor instead of a reactor in your life. So we're, we're about at our time today for you tab, like in summation, what we've been talking mm-hmm. about is like, um, how did you wire? How did you wire either? Like, how do you know that as an adult or like, what do you know about your neurology? What are some of like the either takeaways or um, kind of in summation, what do you, what do you want to leave folks with today? So I think the takeaway I would leave you all with is 
please remember that if you are finding you have symptoms of CPTSD that stem from your childhood, it's not your fault. And th that right there can be a pretty hard pill to swallow. It took me a couple of years to fully lay the responsibility for some of the things my parents did at their doorstep, right? And so while you're in that process, be kind to yourself, mm. keep going. And sometimes when things feel really hard, like you don't know what to do, you don't know who you are anymore, you're in the exact right spot Woo! to make that next choice. So take the pause, be kind, keep going. I love that. How about you, Beth? How about you? Uh, so I would, uh, to further this idea of how to be kind, um, let, me, let me ask you if you were listening to this today. Over the next week or two, why don't you just listen to your internal narrative over the next mm. couple of weeks? See how many times you say something like should, or like what are the, what is the, um, what is the state of your internal life right now? So when we talk about being kind to yourself, um, a lot of times my clients look at me like I'm speaking a completely different language. When I say, well, just be kind, you can be gracious, you can be self-compassionate. Anything I talk to you about is a skill I believe that you have the capacity to learn, not something mm -hmm. you are too inherently flawed to practice. So a great mm -hmm. way to start is, how do I talk to myself on a regular basis? If you already know that that internal narrative is vicious, vituperative, which is a great word. If all you're doing is just like slicing yourself to threat to shreds all the time. Um, imagine that by noticing it, you could decide whether or not that was helping you or harming you. Just that as a place to start. The internal narrative is indeed uh, operating under the guise of protecting you, helping you yes. be excellent taking good care of you, keeping you safe. But like, is it? So when you think about costs and benefits, uh, the other thing is when we're sort of coming out of the fog, when you're breaking that dissociation, um, which is challenging and painful, it's actually the discomfort that kicks you into the change process. So when someone comes to me and they're like, I am uncomfortable, I go, yes, that's actually a good motivator for change. Because if, if realizing that the way you talk to yourself didn't make you uncomfortable, why would you change it? Why would you do anything mm -hmm. about it? So see if you can. So when Tab says, be kind to yourself, if you know how to do that, if you have a self-compassion process, I celebrate you. If that sounds like total nonsense to you, why not just start with, what do I sound like when I'm talking to myself? You know, so if, if the great example is like coffee cup falls off the car, tab is in like a spiral. Like I failed, people are watching me. Someone just saw me make a mistake. Oh my God, I can't get anything right in my life. Like I can't even handle the basics. And I'm like making this up. This is not what Tabitha has told me. But if that's the way you talk to yourself when you make mistakes, the invitation would be, uh, how comfortable would you feel watching an adult say that to a four-year-old in front of you? Great comparison because it's likely that's what happened. Ooh, because also like five years ago, if someone tried to be like one day in the future, you're going to be talking about inner child healing with people all the time. I'd have been like nonsense. <laughs> that's not science. Um, but you know, turns out folks, the science uh, supports that changing your thinking changes your brain. Yep. So we're not just talking about the woo woo feeling stuff. We're going to hit you with that hard science folks. <laughs> Absolutely. And just to back up your hard science, I would say if you have been able to be kind to yourself, like I'm not going to take myself down a notch right now because I made a mistake, right? If you can do that, or if you are more in at the place where you're just observing what's actually happening internally, please find a way to document that for yourself. Yeah. For me, I, I'm not a journaler. 
And so for me, when I started this journey and I was really aware of the negative self-talk that you're talking about, Beth, I made a tick mark for every time I was able to change my thoughts, just a tick mark, not for when I didn't. And it wasn't, I got seven out of 20 times right. It was only the right times because that helped me focus that that is the change I'm looking for. So keep a tally sheet, take notes, but document your success because you'll want to look back on that when it gets hard again. And remember, yes, you can do it. That's right. That's right. And we're here, we're here to help you out. Absolutely. And um, we, we want to hear from you, you know, like um, if you like, rate, subscribe to our podcast, that is of great service to us, but you can also reach us by email if, you know, if there's, because especially there are going to be times in the future where we're going to start talking about some like hot topics and like, we're not perfect too. So one of the things like as, as psychotherapists who are CPTSD survivors ourselves, one of the things we regularly have to do is like talk to each other in the beginning be like, and it's okay if we're not perfect. And then Tap's like, and it is okay if we're not perfect. And I'm like, and we don't have to plan everything. And she's like, yeah, we don't. <laughs> so like, it's okay for you to say like, I liked this. I didn't like this. This could be an okay place to practice. Listen, here we are. Um, so you can reach me at Beth at the CPTSD podcast.com. And you can reach Tabitha at. I'm tab at the CPTSD podcast.com as well. You can also just head over to the CPTSD podcast.com website. And there is a contact button there. So that might be able to, if you can't remember the email address, that might be an easier way to get to it. That's right. Um, we celebrate you. If you've been listening to this for an hour, it absolutely means that you have a vested, vested interest in healing your life. Trademark. Mm -hmm. okay. um, you know, she trademarked that, right? You can heal your life. Yeah. yeah. That's her phrase. Now. Yeah. Respect. Well, she's smart. This is a smart woman. Um, so we're, we're happy you're here. We are so happy you're here. Please keep coming back and listening to more of this. And we hope that it's helpful to you. We sure do. And we have always held you in the highest regard and we will continue to do that. That's a fact. We know that you can do it. Yep. Okay. See you all soon. Bye. Bye.